I could see his finger on the trigger and I could see the hammer pulled back on that little Walther 1911 style action. I had the very brief thought, have I got everything in line? Is there anything I need to pray? <laughs> and I said, the train didn't even slow up at that station. I, I needed to give those thoughts no space because I knew where I was going. Listen up, gang. If you've not heard of Big Tech's ordinance on the internet, you've got to check it out. Ike and his team are wildly popular in the shooting and self-defense community because they are committed to providing the greatest selection of top shelf gear at a fair price, supported by knowledgeable staff and undisputedly the best customer service in the industry. Please thank them for their support of this active self-protection podcast by considering them for any of your gear needs and let them prove to you why they have an almost fanatical fan base of their own. Please visit BigTextOrdinance.com, BigTextOrdinance.com, and let them know the Ask Podcast sent you. All right, gang, welcome back to the Active Self-Protection Podcast. I am your host, Mike Williver, your favorite former Fed with us today, a new friend of mine, Carl Chen. Carl is the uh, author of a book called Evil Invades Sanctuary, the case for security and faith-based organizations. He is the founder of the Faith-Based Ministry Network. Uh, they can be found at fbsnamerica.com, fbsnamerica.com. He is married. He has, I hope you're sitting down for this, five kids, 21 grandkids, and one great grandchild. And as we spoke before we hit the record button, uh, his uh, most important title is Ambassador for Jesus Christ. And uh, as we know, we let our Jesus flag fly kind of high around here, so that's exciting. Carl, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you being here, buddy. You bet. I'm honored to be here. So let's discuss your background before we talk about There's a lot to talk about, obviously, um, as as you, the listeners, will find out here shortly. Uh, Carl has been there, and he, he's done that. So, Carl, growing up, first of all, what part of the country are you from originally? I'm originally from Kansas. Okay, the middle of the country, literally. Middle of the country. That's right. So my wife and I just relocated back here. So after spending 38 years away, uh, we now live within about 15 miles of her mom and dad who are aging, and and uh, we have come back to our roots. That's outstanding. So where were you in the interim? What states would you live in? Lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area for seven years, and uh, then in the uh, uh, Colorado Springs area for a little over 30 years. So you're back in Kansas. Uh, tell us, Carl, what uh, growing up, did you have a lot of exposure to firearms? Uh, were you ever in law enforcement, ever in the military? Uh, talk to us about that real quick. Okay. A lot of exposure to firearms. Uh, was never in the military. Um, never was in law enforcement of any kind. In fact, as I tell people in some of my presentations, I had a tremendous respect for those who were in the military. I did not have that same respect for law enforcement. Um, I was one of those guys that spoke bad about law enforcement and acted bad towards law enforcement. Um, uh, my older brother was in law enforcement uh, most of his career from the time he came home from Vietnam in 1969 and uh, has retired twice. And in his early days, him and I would go around and around about the value of law enforcement. And it wasn't until I needed him, Mike, that uh, I became appreciative of him. And I've never stopped speaking positively of them since 1996. You know, the reason I always ask that question, or almost always, is not because it, it makes anyone more or less prepared to be a defender if they were or weren't in law enforcement or the military, but because I think it's important for our guests to know, hey, was this person uh, previously trained uh, by a government agency? And one of the things I, I like to say about the police is that they can't be everywhere at once. You know, that's part mm -hmm. of the reason we do this show. Part of the reason we do the channel mm -hmm. is the p the police would love to be everywhere at once and be able to protect everyone from all the bad things, but it's just not possible. We'll get into that right. more later. But law enforcement, firearms training is just one of the things that you do in law enforcement, obviously. You you, you have mm -hmm. to do a, a lot of other things in guns frequently and, and marksmanship and firearms training aren't a big priority for a lot of law enforcement. They're just not. It's something they have to do. Uh, which mm -hmm. would surprise some people. But as a firearms instructor with the government, I can tell you that 
there was, you know, there was a percentage of the people who, who trudged to the range, you know, like it was a death march and didn't want to go and didn't want to train. Uh, then there's another percentage that really, really do. So yep. interesting yep. that you didn't, you weren't a big fan of, of law enforcement. Was that just sort of a natural disposition for you or did you have a bad run in with the police or do you, do you remember? I had some bad run ins. There's no question about it. And I had some law enforcement officers do some stupid things mm -hmm. um, around me that kind of came to the front and center of my, my thinking processes regarding law enforcement. Uh, without giving them the benefit of the doubt. And, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're not perfect people. Uh, and often a young man, and I was in high school at the time, expects people in authority over them to kind of walk the line. And when they don't, it sets them up for uh, mistrust. And that's what happened to me as I, I had some law enforcement folks around me at a young age that uh, did some less than exemplary things, uh, thinking they were being popular with the students, but, mm. uh, didn't ring well with me. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple things I want to say about that really quickly. One is, uh, the, the cops who law enforcement officers who aren't very good at their job or, or are just mean and nasty are in the minority, but there's the one, they're the ones you're going to remember. They're the ones that make the news because most That's interactions right. with LE go very well and go very professionally, but the ones that don't yeah. can go frequently very poorly. And another aspect of that is, and probably not so much in your case, but frequently you will see a, a, a cop, a deputy or something doing a thing and out of context, that thing doesn't look very good because you don't know exactly all the circumstances around whatever it is they're doing. And so people will infer all sorts of bad things based on what they're looking at, not knowing mm -hmm. there's something else uh, going on that they're, they're not aware of. With yeah. that said, um, talk to us about your firearms training. Were you always uh, into shooting and, and getting better at shooting, or is this something that only happened after an incident? Oh, no, I, I was always into shooting and did a lot of it. Destroyed my ears in high school because mm. we would go out and shoot a brick of twenty two every weekend, and along with three fifty seven Magnum and forty five and everything else we could shoot. And... Uh, uh, always without hearing protection, of course, because we were guys, you know, you guys don't wear hearing protection right. back in the seventies. And, uh, so that, that's why I wear hearing aids now, but, uh, no, I was always a, a very active shooter. Um, uh, um, uh, I shot a lot. It wasn't until after viewing homicides in front of me as an armed defender that I really got serious about shooting skills. And I got to admit, uh, you know, before you see people die in front of you, uh, I was one of those many conceal carry people. That, oh yeah, I carry all the time. Got one beside my bed all the time. If you had asked me, what my shooting stance was or what my grip was or, uh, you know, what, how consistent I can hit at 20 yards, 25 yards, 15 yards, uh, whether I draw from concealment, I wouldn't have known what any of those terms meant. Mm. I mean, I was still, a, now I know I was a cup and saucer shooter right? You know? <laughs> and, and I didn't even know any of those terms prior to seeing blood let in front of me. And, you know, all of a sudden there's, there's a real wake up call when you begin to realize how serious this is. And then you take your training serious. And what I often tell people in the events where I speak at is that if you're not training, you're still saying it'll never happen here. Yeah. Are you familiar with Stephen Williford? I can't imagine you haven't met. I know Stephen very well. Okay. I speak to him regularly. He will be a speaker at our event this year. He was also at a speaker at our event uh, two years ago. And the first time I ever saw him, I didn't speak to him, but the first time I ever saw him was in Sutherland Springs um, just a couple days after the shooting. I flew down there immediately to just be in the area. And whenever I hear um, the the mentality, it won't happen here or it won't happen to me or won't happen at my church or whatever, I always reference him because you've been there. I haven't. That is a very small town. That is not mm -hmm. a big. That's not a big city. That's not Detroit or Chicago or New Orleans. Right. Sutherland Springs is a dot on the map, and it happened there. 
And it's funny because uh, not only did he do what he did, and everyone knows that story by now uh, about the barefoot defender, but there was an officer in that town for the little tiny police department who was getting everyone tourniquets and getting people trained up on how to apply them and stuff like that. These are these are two people that realize, yes, it can happen here. And ha- he at least had the skills to do what he did. That officer had the the forward thinking to realize, well, we need to get these tourniquets out to our officers. We need to get these people trained on how to use them. Those are two people that weren't assuming it'll never happen here. And I've got to tell you, it haunts me to this day when he told me every time he heard a round going off, I'm sure you've heard this before, in his mind, because that's a, that's a, someone I know, it's a friend of mine, uh, is is being shot right now. Let us discuss um, the the two incidents that you uh, were were present for, and you said they were um, eleven years apart. That's correct. And three miles apart. And three miles apart from so each t- other. That's talk, correct. Talk about it can't happen here. It happened twice in a very very small proximity. So yep. the first event was uh, was where and, and what happened there? It was a focus on the family. And I was building engineer there. I wasn't even in security. But since I managed the stuff that went into the buildings, of course, I was involved anytime we put security systems in. Mm -hmm. And my team, the guys that worked with me uh, and worked for me, were back up to the one security operator that we had for the ministry. So anytime... He would have a situation where he needed help. One radio call, we all wore the same radio, and uh, he would call for our assistance. And after the Oklahoma City bombing in April of 1995, the ministry, and it's not a church, it's a faith-based organization, but it's not a church. Uh, They asked me and a couple others to put together a committee to investigate whether focus on the family was ready for something like Oklahoma city. Hmm. And as a result of that, one of the things we did was we improved our, uh, the ability of our front lines, people, those at the front desk, those at any point of sale, those who were in vulnerable places to have a panic system where it could alert our radios. And, uh, uh, so, a year after Oklahoma City on May 2nd, 1996, we had just got those systems in, one of the panic alerts, and my radio went off and said front desk administration building, and Mike, I literally walked up to the front desk. I mean, this is this is from a person. I mean, I'm, I, I go back and I look at what I was in 1996. I was very engaged with architects, engineers, contractors, all kinds, working to build the buildings and then to manage them. Security was just one little box that I checked off, you Mm -hmm. know, in my due diligence, I could check that box and say, okay, we've done that, wash my hands and move on. Man, that's not the way security needs to be handled. It's very dynamic. It's new every day and it's got to be very intentional, but uh, that's the way I was in 1996. And literally, as I was walking up to the front desk, I was looking at my watch to see if this was a real incident, how long would it take me to get here? That was my whole thinking process. Yeah, mindset is really important. Yeah. And as I came up to the desk, all of a sudden, I thought 17 seconds, not bad. I could be here pretty quick. And I looked up and I was face to face with a gun and an angry gunman. And Mike, I just felt extremely stupid at that point. I had no idea what to say. And uh, as the day went along, we had about 1,500 people on campus, uh, wound up being a mass evacuation. This guy plant. Uh, claimed to have explosives. He had a big green army bag on the floor at his feet and a trigger device, a suicide trigger going to a a handgun in his right hand. He was holding two ladies hostage at the uh, front desk. And uh, as the day progressed, um, and sure, more intense right up there at the start starting minutes a lot of stuff happened in the first few seconds and then kind of drew out that that's the demographic of the hostage situation uh we evacuated all people except for the two 
ladies and myself and the security operator. We were held hostage there for about an hour and a half at gunpoint. And, uh, and when I say that, it's not like he has the gun aimed at you at all times, although all of us did at various times mm-hmm. have, have him pointing the gun right at us and, you know, making his demands. And Mike, it was during that time at one point that I turned around and I looked behind me at the big doors at the front of the building and looked outside, you know, (laughs) I needed something from outside Mm -hmm. and just felt like it was so far away. And when I looked outside, a police officer, a SWAT operator with his vest and his uh, rifle and his shield and all that just stepped out from behind a column and nodded at me. And he, that nod from an officer, I still don't know who he was, was what changed my opinion on law enforcement. With that one nod, he was saying, I'm here, I've got your six, and you're going to be okay. (laughs) he, He communicated so much with that one nod that it, made a believer of me for the rest of my life. And uh, then we got a hostage negotiator on the phone with our gunman. He talked him into letting the four of us go. And then about four and a half hours after that, talked him into laying down his firearm um, and walking out of the building peacefully and allowing himself to be arrested. And I started writing the book, Evil Invade Sanctuary, as we were going through the trial for the gunman some months later. He wanted a jury trial, and so we went through a jury trial and got solid convictions on him. And But it was after that trial process, or actually during it, that I started taking notes and writing about my journey. And then I started speaking to others about it. The first time I ever spoke to anybody, Mike, was to the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce. Some of the local businesses had wanted to know what did focus on the family do towards readiness. And the uh, chamber called me and asked me if I would speak to a group of them. And I did. But then I became more focused just on faith-based organizations instead of just businesses in general, because that's where my heart was. As I I began recognizing that just because you have a cross on the roof and some name that verifies your denomination and your theology on the sign out front, and just because you're a follower of Christ does not mean that you're never going to experience an attack. So I began going around mostly the state of Colorado. In fact, for the first several years, it was only the state of Colorado, speaking to churches about readiness, churches and faith-based organizations. And uh, one of those churches that listened was my own home church of New Life. And uh, we started our team there in 2005. The guy who was running our team was successful in getting the leadership at New Life to acknowledge that some of us should be armed and ready. And then uh, on the day that our killer came, there were four of us in the hallway. Two of us were armed. Uh, The killer killed two girls in the hallway. This was on December 9th, 2007. And uh, uh, our intentional security operations stopped him. And uh, one of the, there were two of us that were armed in the hallway that day. Gina Sam was over halfway between the shooter and I, much closer to him than I was. She took out, uh, she took the shots when she had them and hit him multiple times. And then he put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. And that was an acceptable outcome at that point. Yeah, so often the the outcome of these things is that a lot of these shooters, when they're planning this stuff out and they're fantasizing about you know how it's going to go down in their fantasies, they're not, there's never any resistance. There's never a law enforcement response. There's never a security response where people are prepared for this sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. So let's go back just for a moment. Um, about the the shooting at the New Life Church, this is something that made headlines. I remember there was some closed circuit TV footage, I believe, at least of the lobby area. Isn't that right? Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yeah, I remember seeing seeing such poor footage 
Right. You couldn't even tell when it was police entering. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were cheap little cameras that the IT department had bought over the internet or somewhere just cheap as they could get. You couldn't even identify whether somebody was a good guy or a bad guy off of that. But yes, there was, uh, I think we had six or seven cameras rolling that morning. So let's, let's backtrack for a moment and talk about the preparation and the training. You know, obviously you, you offer training to faith-based organizations. Um, and I don't want to give away the entire thing here, but let's discuss the training you guys did prior to this incident, because you Mm -hmm. didn't just, you know, I think, I think some churches and other organizations just say, Oh, Bob and Jessica both are CCWs and they both have guns. So we figure if something happens, they'll go put down whatever it is. And that's better than nothing, but that's not really a plan. There's a lot more that goes into an effective um, security plan for any organization, but but in our case, uh, churches. So talk to us about the prep you guys did, because you didn't just rise to the occasion that day out of the blue. I'm sure there was a plan and some training in place. So talk to us about that really quick. Well, it, it's interesting, and, and I just got to be 100% truthful here. The training we had prior to that was extremely lacking and poor. I mean, I, when I give my presentation, I, te- I end it with the things we did not do well, Mike. And the only training we had had on active shooter or anything like that, this this just true as can be, is our director of security said, if you hear gunfire, go towards it. That's all the training we had. We had been to the range a few times together as a team. Mike, we shot Blue Rock through a shotgun, and it was a sporting event. Nobody brought a handgun. I mean, you know, I... While I get it that no, I I understand why people say nobody rises to the occasion, but that's not really a hundred percent true. Okay, people will rise to the occasion. <laughs> They're going to do much better at it if they have been trained. And I came out of that whole scenario very thankful that we ended the shooting early and the lady who did pull the trigger at least had been through law enforcement training 10 years earlier in Minneapolis. So she had had some personal training. We had never been to the range together, not once. She had never, she had not even been to one of the shotgun shoots that we had. Our training was not serious in those days. And, and, you know, that that's just the truth of where we were, Mike. Uh, Now that would be the last church anybody should go to expecting to get a successful uh, uh, body count. But when that killer went down in our hallway, he had over 1,400 rounds of ammunition in his backpack. He had posted 13 suicide diatribes prior to coming to our facility in one of those, he said, like Cho, Eric Harris, Ricky Rodriguez, and others, I'm going out to make a stand against this sick, evil religion. Hmm. And then he ended that with a comment that said, Christian America, this is your Columbine. And then signed off the internet, went mobile, and came to our church. And, you know, when when you think about that, <clears throat> he had the wherewithal to make good on that threat. He was after a body count, but he went down because he came up against an armed resistance. Mm -hmm. And even though we weren't serious about training prior to that day, we were willing and we were ready. And uh, because we had a presence there and we were willing to go towards the shooter towards the sound of gunfire and put up a shield to the people behind us in the sanctuary. We, we didn't make it to save the girls in the parking lot. That that's real security. When you're putting up your concentric rings and all that, and you've been through the train. We hadn't been through any of that, Mike. Uh, but what we had been through is 
getting the people there, getting people assigned and set up. And here's one thing I tell folks, you know, the the people on one side of the uh, gun debate, they all want to say, oh, you're going to get innocent people killed. If the teachers have guns, the students are going to use the teacher's yeah. gun to kill each yeah. other. And even a teacher, if he's trying to kill a defender, he's going to kill a bunch of students. It's like I asked one newspaper reporter one time, I, I, I told this reporter from the Dallas Morning News when she started down that line, I said, name me one time that's happened. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, I don't study those statistics. I said, I do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm just asking you, name me a time. I said, I, and I got plenty of time, research it for a day and call me back. Right. I said, but I can name you dozens and hundreds of times where somebody died without a intervention capable defender between that evil and themselves. And many times those are kids and, uh, you know, it, at least we had the willing people there who did go towards the gunfire and who were willing to put up a fight. And because one of those armed defenders hit him in both legs and, and also in his chest with some uh, splatter from the uh, lead that exploded after she hit a weapon, she, she did hit his AR Mm -hmm. and it splattered and went into his chest. Not, not lethal. But because he was confronted with armed defenders, he put the gun to his own head and pulled the trigger. And that is critical. You know, tunnel vision works both ways, Mike. And we train on tunnel vision. Now, most of these active attackers haven't trained on it. But when they see somebody coming down the hallway like this, I guarantee you, they're looking at somebody coming towards them with a firearm in the hand. That person has their attention right there. You have pulled their attention away from the innocent. And uh, most of these kids who die in these school shootings, they had nobody between them and the evil. Mm. And that's what it boils down to is we got to have people who are ready and willing like we were at new life. But I'm going to say, able beyond what we were at new life. And so, that means truly trained and equipped. Let me just say this real quick. You know, we, we, um, we talk about how, you know, now a lot of churches, a lot of, a lot of houses of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques, I'm sure have, uh, security teams. They have at least some sort of plan in place or some sort of security or someone who's armed, and you know, back when when New Life happened, this wasn't nearly as as common a thing. Like the term "active shooter" wasn't really that prevalent. People didn't, um, you know, a Columbine had happened, obviously, but it wasn't something kind of in the the front of our consciousness as a country like it is now. And the fact that you guys had anything, any plan, was probably uh, above average. And what I mean by that is, you know, John, John likes to say at our annual conference, you know, if you're getting any training at all on your firearm as a private defender. You're in the one percent of all all the people in the United States who buy firearms get any training uh, right. beyond, beyond maybe going to the range and putting twenty rounds through it. And they put it in a, in a you know, excuse me, in a closet or a box and forget about it. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you had anything at all uh, probably put you in a very small percentage of houses of worship at, at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think that that has to have had made all the difference. And when you we talk about uh, that guy getting the attention of of the evildoer in a situation like that. Like I said, he's fantasizing about the body count, about the blood and the yep. gore and, and how glorious it's going to be. And in his head, he's not picturing uh, an armed response to that. And so frequently right. during these events, they will either get shot or shoot themselves as soon as that happens. It doesn't always happen. Uvalde shows us that. He got armed resistance and he kept he kept fighting and kept shooting back at the cops. But You know, Mike, you are so right, though. Uh, prior to 2000, the term church security really never existed. I mean, when we were putting together our program at Focus on the Family in the mid-90s, there were not very many models out there that we could look at of what a faith-based security operation should look like. And I remember our president at the time, Dr. James Dobson, 
made the comment several times, we don't want to be Fort Knox. Uh, and, you know, that was kind of the mentality of a lot of faith-based leaders uh, in this whole journey. But the term church security started popping up about 2000 in the early part of the 21st century. And, uh, you know, now it's, like you said, very prevalent. In fact, the Faith-Based Security Network is a national organization of just those church security operators. And we have uh, close to 800 members in 47 states in Washington, D.C. And these are the most serious of the church security operators, those who say, we need to learn together and get better together. And it's the collective acumen of the many that makes it an effective association. It's not built upon the opinions of, of one leader or even a handful of leaders. It's truly a dynamic membership organization where they're, we're better together. So let me ask you this, and I'm going to play, literally going to play devil's advocate here for a second. Mm -hmm. What would you say to either a non-Christian or to a Christian uh, in, in a congregation who objects to this sort of thing, who says, well, I mean, we're, you know, we're Christians. We don't run around carrying guns and looking scary. Or or to, let's say to an atheist who says, um, won't your God protect you? That sort of thing. I'm sure you've heard that in the past. Like, why do you need guns for? Why won't God protect you from the evildoer, yada, yada? Uh, what's your response when you hear that sort of thing? Well, the the biggest source of problem is from the Christian leaders. <laughs> I mean, it's not the atheists who are fighting us on this. It's mm -hmm. the Christian leaders. And I often take them through the Sermon on the Mount, the sixth chapter of Matthew. You know, towards the end of the sixth chapter, Christ told us to not worry about what we eat, drink, or wear. And Mike, I've, I've been a Christian now since 1979. I've I've been around this environment a lot. I've served on church boards. I worked in ministries. Uh, I have never seen met anybody yet who wakes up in the morning and clothes float, float down on them out of heaven. I just haven't met that person that has manna appear on their plate every morning. And as they walk down the street, they have some heavenly mist sprayed in them to satisfy the thirst. But but Jesus said, don't worry about these things. Doesn't that mean he's going to supply them? Uh, yeah, it means don't worry. And, and worry is something we shouldn't do. But you know what? We have to be intentional about the things that we procure and manage to eat, drink, and wear. Security is the same way. The, uh, we, we know that the devil is a roaring lion seeking those he may devour. How does he do that? He does it through people. Mm -hmm. The same way God works, the devil works in the same way. There is evil in our society, and it is coming to strike those who suspect it the least. It's looking for victims. And we must take the, the attitude that we will protect those people with us. For us to say, well, if it's their time to go, it's their time to go is one of the most uh, uh, embarrassing forms of denial that I've seen out of the church. And I really take task with anybody who says, uh, I'm not going to allow any kind of a intervention capable defense in our church. Yeah, you know, um, if you're if you're planning a, a potluck at your church, you're preparing for it. You're telling people, "Hey, I need you to bring the beans. I need you to bring the salad. I need you to right. bring the burger buns or whatever." Um, and it, it's funny; it, it is the one thing that people tend to either um, deny exists or deny will happen here, like we said earlier, mm -hmm. or it's one of the things they try to wish away um, and hope it doesn't happen. And mm -hmm. you know. It's funny. Church, churches are funny, and people who listen to the show maybe don't go to church regularly, don't know yeah. there there are politics at churches. Unfortunately, it's just the reality of the situation. There are people who want to play politics, who will play each other off each other. There's church boards, there's elders or deacons, and so every church is a little bit different. Um, if you are a church member and you are security minded, 
by the way. Uh, don't forget the website is fbsnamerica.com, Faith-Based Security Network, uh, and there are resources there uh, for you. Carl, let's talk a moment about ready, willing, and able. That's something we talked about again before we hit the record button here. Talk to us about what that means to you in the context of uh, church or any kind of security for that matter. Well, those three words are sort of the the mantra of the faith-based security network. In fact, for our members, we have video series called the RWA, Ready, Willing, Able Video Series. And to us, that's what protection boils down to, is being ready. What does ready mean? It means you're on site, present, ready. Ed Monk is a teacher that that would be a good host for you on here someday. He's already on the list. Oh, yeah, you need to get him on. Uh, To him, what ready means is that you've got people intentionally placed in such a way where they are likely to see or hear the first gunshot. That's what we mean by ready, is you're there. Willing means that you've been through the mental and spiritual preparation. You've already crossed those lines in your mind. Our good mutual friend Dave Grossman says the body can't go where the mind hasn't been. He said so, and another great possibility for you to interview someday, one of the leaders in this, this battle to get people ready. You've got to evaluate, uh, are you truly willing to confront evil? And then the last thing is able. Are you able? To us, able means that you're both trained and equipped to be intervention capable. You know, I, I had a lady come up to me at a conference I was speaking at once, and she told me, she said, you know, I had a guy come up to me with a gun and I just said, in the name of Jesus, put down that gun. And she said, he dropped it and ran. And, you know, she was basing her philosophy of what everybody should do upon her one encounter. And I don't, I don't deny that that works sometimes to say in the name of Jesus, drop your gun and go away. But what I wanted to tell her was, you know, there's also a lot of times on the street, that guy and others had run up to somebody who said, you don't blankety blank, put that blanking gun down. I'm going to blankety blank, make you eat the blankety blank thing. And he put it down and ran. That's not a defense. It's not a strategy. No. (laughs) Yeah. That's no strategy. Uh, We teach that you've got to be, uh, intentional about the setup of your program. And that intention has to go through that whole process of making your team ready, willing, and able. I love the term responsible defenders. And that's what we need in our schools. That's what we need in our churches. That's what we need in our Walmarts. Uh, It's time to stop playing games with this. It's like Ed Mock says on a deal. I listened to him on just this morning, and he'll be one of our speakers at our big annual event in Springfield this year. Uh, Ed said, you can sit there with a team of safety planners and talk about hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, tornadoes. You can have disagreement around the table. You're going to have disagreement around the table on the best way to do that. But you can work through that disagreement. The minute you start talking about active shooters and a gun comes into the conversation, people lose their mind. Mm -hmm. They lose their ability at reason. They all of a sudden take political sides, both sides, and say, has to be this way, has to be that way. And all of a sudden, reason is gone. And it's all about politics and emotions Mm -hmm. at that point. We don't have that same problem when we talk about fire, earthquakes, and tornadoes. Uh, uh, But for some reason, we have allowed this gun debate 
to drag us all away from the ability to have an adult conversation. And what it's going to boil down to, and, and this is what those that are just so opposed to any discussion of gun want to say is, oh, we can't have guns around people. Innocent people are going to be killed. And like I told the Dallas reporter, name me once, right. name me one time that's happened uh, where somebody defending the defenseless with a firearm accidentally wounded or killed others. There's always the possibility, you know, dur during a, a gunfight, there's always a possibility of an innocent third party being hit. Um, that, that doesn't. Absolutely. Yeah. And we should train for that, but it shouldn't be the focus of our basis for making decisions. Something else I want to mention, uh, and we're about running out of time here. This has been delightful, by the way, Carl. I want to thank you again for coming on. Um, I think another important component of this, and I'm sure you would agree, is what John and I call spiritual fitness. So being right with your God and being right with your family members, you know, having having said that thing to your husband or wife, saying, you know, I love you, not leaving an argument right. uh, to stew, uh, letting everyone in your life know how you feel about them. Uh, you know, if I were to get hit by a truck today, nobody would wonder where they stood with me. They would all know, mm -hmm. for good or ill, by the way, uh, they mm -hmm. would all know exactly how I felt. And I, I think that's so important if you're going to be uh, the person who steps into the breach, who puts yourself in a position to be a defender of the innocent, that you make sure all those things are constantly taken care of so that so that you're not distracted at the moment of truth. So when you have to go towards gunfire, you're not saying, oh, man, you know, I was really rude to my wife this morning or I was or mm -hmm. I said something mean to my kids and I meant to talk to him about it, but I didn't or uh, I'm not sure where I stand with God. Those should be questions you've answered before this sort of thing happens because those can distract mm -hmm. you and you don't want your last thought, God forbid, you don't survive that encounter defending the innocent. You don't want your last thought to be, I wish I would have. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That is so, so very true. Max Licato, the great Christian writer, once said, you can't write better than you live. Mm. So I stole that and rewrote it. I plagiarized that comment and 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 changed it for my church security teams and i tell them you can't serve better than you live mm. you you need to get things right at home and they need to stay right and i've i've often thought about a moment in the hostage situation on may 2nd 1996 when the gunman got angry at me and 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 planted the gun in my forehead and was yelling at me, telling me uh, how angry he was. And I had no right to be mad at him. And at those times, Mike, you prioritize your prayers. And the fleeting thought, and I was able to share this at an Islamic mosque that had asked me to come in and help their team be ready. And I'll, I'll help any team be ready. And I was able to share this story at a mosque. And uh, they asked me, you know, what was going through your mind? And I told them, I said, when that guy shoved the gun in my forehead and started yelling at me, and I could see his finger on the trigger, and I could see the hammer pulled back on that little Walther 1911 style action. Uh, I had the very brief thought. Have I got everything in line? Is there anything I need to pray? <laughs> and I said, the train didn't even slow up at that station. I, mm. I needed to give those thoughts no space because I knew where I was going. And I knew what decisions I had made. My prayer at that moment was I prayed for my wife and family that they would be happy and continue to laugh the rest of our life. Mike, if you were to observe our family through the years growing up, and they've all moved away now and got their own families, but in those days when all five of our kids were still in the house, we laughed a lot. We love life. My wife loves life. She laughs a lot. And my prayer was help them understand this was not a horrific thing for me <laughs> because I was just doing what I needed to do. And I didn't go down in terror 
Lord, help them understand. This is this. Don't let this mark the rest of their life. And then when I got done with that prayer, I realized I hadn't been shot yet, so I had time for another. And I said, Lord, please have him put that gun down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you are so right. Uh, and I, I have thought of that so often when I hear of somebody who died tragically that wasn't ready. And we use that term, we're sorry for your loss. Mm. Well, if we know where they went, it's not a loss. Right. And uh, that's, you are so right. That is the first thing to make sure of. You can't serve better than you live. Let me close with this. Uh, This week's show I'm dedicating to Sally. And those who know me know who Sally is and was and where she is now. She, the Lord kept her here for well over a hundred years to be an amazing prayer warrior for so many people. So Sally, this one's for you. Carl, thank you so much. And folks, remember it is F is in Frank, B is in boy, S is in Sam, N is in Nora America, FBSNAmerica.com. There are resources there and he can be reached there. The book is Evil Invades Sanctuary, the case for security and faith-based organizations. Carl Chin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for what you do for American Defenders. All right, gang, it is that time once again for the Gutowski Files featuring Stephen Gutowski. Stephen is the founder of TheReload.com and the host of the weekly Reload podcast, which if you are a member at TheReload.com, uh, you can get that a day early. In fact, probably, frankly, probably, every, and everyone is saying this, probably the best episode ever uh, featuring some guy named Mike Williver, um, it was just recently. So I, I enjoyed doing that a lot. So thanks for having me on, Stephen. Welcome. Yeah, I thought that was a really good conversation. Kind of expanded on what we had talked about on the Active Self Protection podcast last week. So you know, people should check it out if they want to hear a bit more about uh, you know active shooter response and and some of the mistakes made in in Uvalde. So. It's definitely something worth listening to. <laughs> I made the mistake of looking at the YouTube version of it. And of course, there's one comment and it's like, ah, I didn't like this episode. <laughs> that much. Yeah, there it wasn't never, much elaboration. <laughs> it, it, ne- it never fails. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the, the thousand people might like it, but the one who doesn't is going to be the noisiest person for, for whatever reason. And it's the one that you'll always focus on. That's just how... It's just how it goes. Yeah, don't read the comments, <laughs> folks. Don't read the comments, yeah. whatever you do. So this week we are discussing um, uh, new gun bans in New York State. In the wake of the Buffalo shooting, uh, this article is by Eric Ava over on TheReload.com. Uh, dateline for that is June 6th. And we're discussing um, the governor there, Kathy. And I, I, I terribly – sorry, I can't – I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Is it Hokul or Hokul? I think it's Hochul. Hochul? Not, okay. Uh, my apologies to the governor. Uh, signed a collection of new gun restrictions on Monday, and I'm going to read directly from the article. The package includes laws that raise the age requirement to purchase rifles like the AR-15, confiscate magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, oh boy, tighten red flag laws, and restrict civilian purchases of bullet-resistant armor. One of the laws also requires social media to respond to potential threats. Another law mandates micro-stamping for handguns, a theoretical, emphasis on theoretical gun tracking technology. And the governor says, quote, this comprehensive package will close loopholes, give law enforcement the tools they need to prevent easy access to guns, and stop the sale of dangerous weapons to 18-year-olds, she said on Monday. A uh, couple of things. Uh, Stephen, you and I were discussing this before we uh, before we started this, this portion of the show. Um, let's talk about micro-stamping. Uh, the law mandates micro-stamping for handguns. Uh, and as far as I know, uh, you can tell me this is a technology that doesn't exist yet. Do you want to talk to us about what it is and why it might not be practical in, in, in practice? Yeah, that's right. This is uh, effectively a theoretical technology. There's no gun manufacturer in the world that actually produces a gun with micro stamping technology integrated into it. Um, and so this, this ban on the sale of handguns that don't incorporate micro stamping is effectively just a ban on all handgun sales Mm -hmm. in New York, which is uh, the, that would make this the first law of its kind to do that. Um, Now, you know, the state, this law requires the state agency to verify the viability of this technology before it goes into effect. Um, However, uh, while this would be the the most expansive version of, of a law like this, California does have a similar pr- 
law in place right now and has had it in place for over a decade, in fact, uh, which requires all new models of handguns to incorporate micro stamping technology at, after the date it's deemed to be viable. And it was deemed to be viable actually under Kamala Harris, if I remember correctly, in 2013. So it's been about a decade. And uh, well, Mike, do you want to guess how many new models of handguns have been made, uh, have been approved for sale in California over that time? Um, three? Zero? Zero. Because because there's no, because they don't incorporate right. micro stamping. Nobody makes a gun with that technology. Uh, and just to explain what exactly micro stamping is, uh, you know, the, in theory. effectively, right, in theory, uh, it would involve having a, a part in the gun that can imprint a unique identifying mark on every shell casing that is fired uh, f- you know, from the firearm. So basically something that would imprint uh, you know, a QR code or a serial number on every shell that's fired so that if, it, if those shell casings are recovered in a, a crime scene, they can then be matched to a gun definitively. Uh, that's the concept, right? That's the idea behind this, this requirement. Um, now the problem is again, that, that nobody actually makes these products. It's not, it's not something that anyone has ever put out a prototype right. device of even, you know, you've seen a couple of prototype like smart guns, you know, where, uh, biometric locks or RFID locks have been in, incorporated into, a gun's design and there's been uh prototypes of that made at least there haven't been there's no company that's ever produced a uh, even a prototype model of uh micro stamping uh, a micro stamping handgun uh i believe there was a study done by a researcher that that sort of uh, is what is used um as the the evidence for viability of this technology uh you know years ago uh, but nobody has ever tried to bring one of these guns to market. You know, I think just a couple problems with this, not the least of which is um, we talked again, we talked before about where exactly, what part of the gun would leave this imprint. There's only really two two parts of the gun where it seems practical would be the firing pin and maybe the extractor somehow. Uh, any other location for any kind of stamping technology to leave that that unique mark on the shell casing would be, I guess, maybe some part of the slide, but that I I can't imagine how that wouldn't impede the functionality of the gun. And then the other thing is no matter what part of the gun would leave this theoretical mark, you need, you would need to have a unique identifier for hundreds of thousands, millions of guns. And you're only talking about a very small, not a lot of real estate on the end of a firing pin. And then talk to us about wear and tear. I mean, that's, that's another thing to to have to consider in all this. Um, Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know that it's, it's theoretically possible. I don't know that it's practically possible. It's, it's certainly a, a theory that has a lot of practical challenges to it. Yeah. I, presumably the most obvious way to implement it would be to have a firing pin that uh, has, you know, a raised section that was, has the ability to leave an imprint on the primer when it's fired. You know, obviously when you fire a center fire uh, handgun, and of course, then you also have to deal with the, the fact that rim fires is, is another technology that is out there. It's right. common, but but uh, yeah, I, I guess suppose in the, the striker and a rim fire, um, you presumably that's where you would put these engraving uh, marks. Uh, but of course, those would those can wear down over time. I don't know that a primer is also very um, resilient in terms of holding. Uh, a stamp like that, mm-hmm. you know, there's obviously a lot of practical questions. Uh, perhaps those could be worked out. I don't, I don't know. I'm not an expert on that sort of uh, thing. You know, I know about firearms. I know how they work and I can understand why this would be a big challenge to do, but uh, maybe there are ways to overcome it. The, but the practical reality right now is that nobody's developed this sort of technology. Nobody in any part of the world, there's no, it's not like, you know, European police carry around guns with micro stamp technology incorporated in them or whatever uh they just it just isn't something that exists anywhere um and and that's doesn't seem to be something that outside of 
these two state legislatures, there's any demand for either. Um, so it does sort of remind me a bit of um, Maryland's program to have every shell case, every gun sold in the state uh, send a fired shell casing to the state police for archiving uh, with the purpose of being able to compare that shell casing to any ca- casings found at a crime scene. Oh, so it solved, you know, they, a, solved a bunch of cases with that technology then? Yeah, they had that in place for, uh, I think it was uh, nearly 15 years, and they never solved a single crime with it, huh. and then they shut it down. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of these sort of CSI-type solutions that you hear come up in uh, legislatures uh, that are just kind of um, infeasible in real life. And this seems to be one of them. We can talk about the CSI effect. That's when uh, you have a prosecutor and an investigator dealing with a jury who's watched every episode of CSI in every city that it's ever been hosted in and believes what they're seeing on the screen, that all these crazy things are possible and they're just not. And a, a clever defense attorney will definitely use that to, to their advantage. Let's talk for a moment about um, the confiscation of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. That mm-hmm. – um, that's kind of the scariest part. But whenever I read stuff like this, I have to remind myself that every time there's an election coming up or every time there's a crisis to be exploited, um, you will have people on the right yelling, they're going to take all your guns away, vote for me. And people on the left saying they're, they're, you know, they don't care about your, your dead family members, vote for me. Uh, I wonder if they're actually planning on confiscating uh you know, quote unquote, high capacity magazines, any magazine holding more than 10 rounds, if people don't turn them in and how would they even know where to go? I don't think it's practical. Uh, I don't like any kind of confiscation uh, magazine or or firearm related. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing that's been sort of undercovered in this new package of gun laws in New York. You know, there's been a lot of focus on upping the age to buy semi-automatic rifles uh, you know, like the AR-15, uh, upping that to 21, that's sort of become one of the new wrinkles in the conversation around gun policy since the Buffalo and, and Uvalde shootings, because those both of those shooters were 18 years old um, when they purchased their fo- firearms and carried out their attacks. But, but you know, the, the more uh, expansive policies passed by New York really don't have anything, don't have much to do with what happened in uh, in this case. Now I suppose, uh, you know, the micro stamping of handguns obviously is, doesn't have anything to do with it. Banning, not just banning, but confiscating uh, magazines that hold more than 10 rounds is obviously has something to do with, with Buffalo since he used uh, a, a magazine with more than 10 rounds, but uh, you know, it, it's also something that's an extremely um, expansive policy it's extremely forceful because it doesn't allow people who previously legally purchased these magazines and were previously legally allowed to continue possessing them uh to have them anymore and that's and they'll have to turn them in or destroy them or face you know potential cr- uh, criminal charges for p- the possession of, of these magazines and um that's a pretty radical departure from uh, most gun laws in the United States, although it's not unique, I will say that much. The neighboring state, New Jersey, passed a similar law a couple of years ago where they lowered the magazine limit from 15 to 10, and then they made it. Then later on, they made it illegal to possess all those old magazines that used to be legal. Um, of course, these policies. One of the problems is that uh, you know people understandably worry about door-to-door confiscation. You know, if you becoming a felon overnight, that that sort of thing with these policies, which, you know, it's understandable why people would worry about that. But in reality, what tends to happen is they just don't enforce these laws uh, in any realistic way, uh, in any any sort of organized fashion. So New Jersey saw zero magazines turned in. Presumably there were millions of those magazines in the state, hundreds of thousands at least, right? Um, given the number of guns owned by people and how many of them commonly uh, have uh, magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, but uh, none of, none of those were ever turned into state police. Uh, Shocking. 
So, you know, uh, New York's gone through this before, too. They passed the SAFE Act back in 2013 after uh, the Sandy Hook shooting. And that required, uh, it, it outlawed a, a new swath of, of rifles uh, and required that the old ones be registered, that in order to keep them legally, you had to register them. And that, that solved very little compliance as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, very few people actually complied with that law. And, the, and one of the issues is like the places where these sorts of guns are, are popular uh, or these magazines are pop- that they're going after now are, are popular are places where the local police aren't interested in trying to, uh, you know, basically start uh, rounding up everyone who owns them uh, within the community. And not that you necessarily even could if you wanted to on a practical level, but it's something where there just isn't a buy-in from law enforcement often on trying to enforce these confiscation efforts or these registration efforts. And uh, it doesn't seem to affect lawmakers in places like Albany, but uh, but it's certainly something that when you think about the reality of how effective a policy like this could even be, if you, even if you agree with it. Uh, it's important to consider. Yeah, and we talked previously in this space about the Buffalo shooter and how uh, red flag laws probably should have you know, affected that outcome and about how uh, non-detachable magazine you know, had no effect on the outcome of that incident because uh, people, criminals, will find a way around these. And I think that's the larger point, Stephen. Uh, I'll wrap it up by saying this. Criminals don't obey gun laws. Criminals will find a way to get guns. And the only way to make yourself safer from criminals who are going to get guns one way or another is to be able to protect yourself. You can't rely on the police. The police would love to be everywhere at once and come rescue everyone. They just can't possibly do it. Ask me how I know. And if you're not prepared to be your own rescuer, your own savior in that moment, um, it's not going to end well. And they, they can pass all the laws they want, make all the restrictions they want. Um, I, I hope people ignore these uh, unconstitutional, in my opinion, in immoral laws. And uh, I hope the people of New York at some point will um, will decide enough's enough and that these, these grandstanding politicians, and it's on both sides, let's be honest, uh, these grandstanding politicians aren't doing us any good with these new laws, especially laws that enact technology that doesn't exist yet. Anyway. Folks, if you are lamenting the lack of down-the-middle fair, sane, sober reporting on the Second Amendment and all things gun-related, please, I beseech ye, go over to thereload.com and consider getting a membership over there. It's a great site. It's good stuff. And Stephen relies solely on his members to fund his important work. Stephen, thank you so much for being on. We'll see you next week, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, friends. This is John Correa. If you like the podcast, if it is bringing you value, do me a favor just rate the podcast and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. 